Good morning. I'd first like to apologize for not being able to make my presentation in per person. My absence is due to uh, an unforeseen um, scheduling conflict that arose with RAND at the last minute. I do, however, hope that uh, this video presentation will at least partially make up for my absence at the conference. Uh, the topic that um, I was asked to present on is small arms and light weapons trafficking at sea. But before I get on to that, I would like to say a few words about the nature of contemporary security. Many of today's challenges that confront the global polity do not have the same linear and stable quality and predictable quality that characterize threat contingencies during the Cold War and even into the new millennium. Many challenges today blur the erstwhile distinction between national and international security. Uh, very few take the form of overt military aggression stemming from a clearly defined sovereign source. In many cases, they involve effects that directly feed off one another, which serves to enhance and exacerbate their overall threat potential. And arguably, most importantly, they cannot be readily deterred by the traditional defenses that states have erected to defend both themselves and their populations. The maritime environment is particularly vulnerable to these threat contingencies. Covering around about 144 million square miles, most of this maritime expanse takes the form of high seas that lie beyond the sovereign jurisdiction of any single state. These over-the-horizon uh, oceans are bounded by a complex lattice of coastal and territorial waters that, due to either a lack of will or a lack of resources, and in some cases both, remain effectively unpleased. Compounding the situation is the unregulated nature of the maritime sector, which is designed to be as accessible as possible in order to reduce costs and uh, maximize turnover. Whilst uh, this type of configuration may be highly uh, suitable for promoting efficiency by um, undercutting and minimizing bureaucratic red tape, it obviously exposes the maritime sec sector to potential exploitation by criminals, by insurgents, uh, and, and uh, by terrorists who seek to exploit the open and unregulated nature of the maritime sector for their own nefarious purposes. Um, as I said, uh, the, the topic that I will be looking at with respect uh, to maritime security challenges is the trafficking of small arms and light weapons. And to give you an idea, uh, there was a recent uh, seizure of an arms consignment uh, that took place um, in, um, uh, earlier this year, in April 2012, which involved a consignment of arms and munitions that were being sent uh, to Libyan, uh, to Libyan uh, rebels who were fighting to overthrow Gaddafi. The cargo included heavy machine guns, light uh, artillery shells, rockets, rocket-propelled grenades, launchers and explosives. Um, this type of uh, seizure, which was uh, uh, apprehended by the Lebanese uh, Navy, uh, underscores the extent of the, the quality, the range and the volume of munitions that are currently being trafficked around the world to non-state actors. Um, so what is it about light arms that lend themselves uh, to easy trafficking? Next slide, please. Well, they have a number of features and characteristics that uh, avail uh, covert movement. By definition, uh, small arms are light, which means that they can be readily transported by air, by land, by sea, and even by post. They are also um, extremely durable, which uh, allows them to uh, be sent on board commercial vessels for extended periods of time without degrading their operational um, uh, capacity and potential. Uh, vessels themselves uh, typically make circuitous routes around the world, which opens up a plethora of pick-up and drop-off points for weapons stocks. And finally, uh, open registry states, uh, or so-called flags of convenience, allow traffickers to continually alter the identity of their vessels, which uh, maximizes or uh, greatly uh, enhances the difficulty of uh, tracing a weapons uh, paper trail or a weapons supply route. In many cases, uh, flags of convenience uh, allow a vessel 
uh, to uh, re, re, re-register and rename itself um, at sea without the owners uh, being physically present um, at the Bureau. Essentially, so long as the money is paid, that ship can take on a new identity. And in many cases, that identity is changed at sea while the vessel is in transit. And so that obviously provides a headache uh, for law enforcement authorities who are seeking to follow potential uh, weapon supplies. Now, recipients of small arms and light weapons um, uh, range from insurgent actors to terrorists uh, to criminal organizations, uh, as well as to states that have been subjected to international arms embargoes. Um, so the, the, the range of actors that can be uh, implicated in uh, small arms and light weapons trafficking is uh, exceptionally um, large. Um, and we know this by the fact that uh, in many of the conflict areas today, uh, even disaggregated and for one of a better word, poor and um, un, un, uh, untrained militias, they still seem to be able to access uh, fairly significant and advanced armories which they can use for their own purposes. Um, there, while um, so, uh, small arms and light weapons uh, are procured from states that, that are generally procured from states that have some or, or all of the following characteristics. Um, corruption and entrenched uh, white collar criminality Weak national regulations cont- uh, cont- uh, uh, on acquiring uh, light arms or securing surplus stocks, an advanced munitions manufacturing sector, and intensive throughput of trade. Now, these characteristics have found their clearest expression in a number of specific regions of the world. In the Americas, particularly the United States, Guatemala, and Paraguay. In Europe, particularly Belgium, Bulgaria, France, Germany, Italy. UK, Romania, um, uh, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. In Asia, China is particularly important here. I'll get onto that in a minute. Pakistan, Thailand, Vietnam, and Afghanistan. The former Soviet Union, especially Belarus, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, and Ukraine. And then we also have a significant amount of weaponry coming out of the Middle East from Israel and from Africa, particularly South Africa. Now, of these various countries, China is rapidly emerging as one of the most uh, prominent uh, sources for small arms and light weapons uh, uh, munitions, especially for rebel and organized organized criminal groups operating in the wider Asia-Pacific theater. The country's burgeoning munitions arms trade has been driven by capital losses uh, resulting from a decline in the legal demand for small arms. Corruption and the lack of adequate regulation and controls over giant arms conglomerations such as Norinco and Polytechnologies. Most of these these illicit uh, consignments are organized by private middlemen um, and are dispatched from the country's southerly ports of uh, Zhangjiang, Hong Kong and Guangzhou. Shipments are either sent direct to uh, the recipients or trafficked via third countries where import controls and inspections are known to be weak. Now, there are several uh, key personalities that are involved in the trafficking of uh, light weapons, and I'd like to say a a quick word about uh, these various uh, actors now. So if we could go on to the slides, starting with transportation agents. Thank you. Transportation agents constitute the conveyor belt in small arms and light weapons trafficking, acting as the main entity for ensuring the safe and secure delivery of weapons to chartered uh, destinations. These individuals are selected for their ability to fulfill a number of important uh, functions, such as obtaining vessels in the first place, hiring the crew that will uh, man those vessels, and sometimes these crew do not know that the ship is going to be used to traffic um, uh, weapons, providing resupply facilities for the vessel while it is making its journey, securing authorizations for all countries through which the weapons will pass, um, charting naval routes and organizing temporary storage uh, for munitions prior to dispatch. Next slide. Another important actor is the broker. 
the brokers actually typically serve as the linchpin as the linchpin um, for uh, ship, weapon shipments that are operating in the white, grey and black markets. They deal with illicit recipients and governments who want to conceal their involvement in arms transfers. Some brokers are directly involved in buying, selling and trafficking weapons, uh, while others uh, are, concentrate only on negotiating deals without ever physically taking possession of arms. While the former, the ones that get involved with all aspects of the trade, obviously are able to make higher volumes of profits, the latter, uh, the ones that don't actually take physically, physically take control uh, or possession of the arms, are more immune from prosecution. Although uh, brokers necessarily need to remain anonymous, they still have to uh, ensure that uh, their skills and their identity are known to potential customers. Um, as a result, they uh, usually adopt um, multiple identities, make extensive use of front companies, and cloud their operations in layers of transnational administration. Finally, we have the documentation forgers, and they are the magicians in the small arms and light weapons trade. The professionals who transform illicit consignments into the ones that have the appearance of fully and appropriately accredited cargoes. The art of these white collar uh, criminals lies in their ability to falsify the necessary paperwork required for the illicit transnational movement of freight. And this paperwork includes freight authorizations, cargo manifests, end user certificates, dangerous good transportation licenses, customs entries, invoices, and letters of credit. Of, this, of these various dimensions of paperwork, perhaps the most important are the end user certificates, uh, largely because they allow small arms and light weapons to be moved legally uh, to what on the surface appear to be legitimate recipients. Now, the the movement or the covert movement of small arms and light weapons have had uh, debilitating and uh, highly um, uh, significant consequences for national, regional and international security. Most directly, it has considerably heightened the violence potential threshold of numerous non-state actors, including crime syndicates, drug lords, insurgents and terrorists many of whom are now able to take advantage of armed responses that were formerly the preserve of the state and its armed forces. On a more general level, small arms have directly torn at the social fabric of many states around the world, in violent, inviting violent responses to unsolved problems, and just as importantly, encouraging, um, overshadow, sorry, just as importantly, overshadowing the efforts of those seeking to develop uh, and employ peaceful mechanisms to unsolved uh, problems and internal challenges. The trade is also directly um, impacted on fiscal management and global stability uh, by feeding black or shadow economies, maiming uh, human productive capacity, uh, discouraging overseas investment, and undermining the consolidation of still weak democracies by encouraging um, official corruption. Uh, in, in my slides, I've included uh, a number of uh, um, uh, examples of uh, infamous uh, traffickers. I won't go through all of them, but uh, a couple are worth uh, uh, a mention. We have Victor Boot, who's, the who's uh, often referred to as the Merchant of Death, and he was the uh, personality on, on whom the Nicolas Cage movie, the, the uh, uh, Lord of War, Sorry, the Lord of War was made. Uh, Kumar and Pathmanathan, he was the weapons procurement specialist for the Tamil Tigers. Um, he travelled extensively around the world. He was known to operate in uh, Eastern Europe, Southern Africa, uh, and especially in Southeast Asia. And he controlled what were known as the Sea Pigeons, which was the maritime procurement network of the Tamil Tigers, uh, which at its height numbered around about 12 to 15 ocean-going vessels. They were critical to uh, sustaining the militant campaign of the Tamil Tigers on the ground, largely because um, there was no access or ready access of weaponry uh, within Sri Lanka for the insurgents themselves. 
And another famous one was uh, Dawood Ibrahim, uh, who heads D Company, which was the uh, otherwise known as the Bombay Mob. He's possibly he's one of the most notorious and wanted criminals in India. He is known to have worked very closely with Lashkar e Taiba, um, as well as Lashkar e Javangi. Uh, both of which have been at the forefront of sectarian and re religious attacks in uh, in India, and at least with respect to Lashkar e Taiba, was the organisation that carried out the spectacular Mumbai assault in uh, 2008. And as I said, uh, uh, Dawood is currently uh, the, the the most wanted man in India. He's subject to an Interpol arrest warrant. And he's currently thought uh, to be hiding in Karachi, allegedly with the di with the complicity of Pakistan's inter-service intelligence directorate. Now, as we've seen, uh, the consequences of light arms and small arms trafficking are enormous, uh, crossing uh, uh, the various divisions of human security, political security, and economic security, as well as military security. How then can we con control? Um, um, the covert movement of light weapons. Well, stamping out the illicit trade is going to be very difficult, largely because there are certain, uh, largely because there are so many munitions that are out there, and also because um, uh, even with respect to the most efficient ports, actually intercepting arms shipments is going to be more by luck uh, than by um, design. Uh, even the most efficient ports would probably only inspect about 10% of incoming cargo, meaning that there's a very high probability of uh, weapons as well as other illicit commodities such as drugs escaping the attention of customs authorities. Now, although these realities must make, make us uh, be sober about the prospects of uh, controlling light arms, there are certain things that can be done. And I have uh, listed a number of them here. We can promote supplier traceability by tagging weapons and ammunition. Uh, states can conclude and enforce agreements calling for the destruction of surplus armed stocks within their territorial boundaries. Uh, we, uh, uh, states can also, and the international community, can create specific small uh, arms registries to better regulate small arms and light weapons exports. Uh, we can strengthen measures aimed at countering documentation fraud, particularly with respect to end-user certificates, which, as I said, uh, are possibly the most important uh, form of paperwork that are involved, uh, that is involved in the illicit trade of small arms. We need to strengthen uh, regional customs, law enforcement, and intelligence structures, and increase uh, cooperation between them, both on a state. Uh, both on an uh, interstate level and on an international level. Uh, certainly we can tighten national legislation to make it more difficult to uh, obtain small arms and light weapons in the first place. Uh, certainly in the United States that, that, that has been uh, something that has been suggested, uh, particularly with respect to light arms that are trafficked although not by sea, but are still trafficked into Mexico. Philippines is another country in point where obtaining light weapons is exceptionally easy and where states have uh, sought to um, institute far more draconian uh, regulations to control the acquirement of weapons. Uh, we can boost stockside security by adequately training and resourcing customs and port authorities. And finally, I think pressure needs to be put on uh, open registry countries to adopt more stringent regulations for vessels flying their flags, which will at least help uh, to minimize the difficulty of following small arms weapons movements uh, when they occur. And that will be of great assistance uh, to law authorities. Well, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, again, I would like to apologize for not being there in, in person, but I hope that uh, my remarks will be able to stimulate at least some uh, conversation in, in the panel. And I wish you very well with the remainder of the conference. And with that, I will say goodbye. Thank you.